from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. From Washington, the combined radio and television industry brings you a special report on the soft polio vaccine. The Public Health Service of the Department of Health, Education and Welfare has been conducting extensive tests on the vaccine, and tomorrow the department is releasing its final report on the findings of those tests. To give you the highlights of that report, here now are the Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare, Mrs. Ovita Kulpavi, and the Surgeon General of the United States Public Health Service, Dr. Leonard A. Sheely. Secretary Hobby. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Poliomyelitis and the safety of the Sork anti-polio vaccine is vitally important to all of us. Scientific processes are often difficult for us to understand as laymen. Yet it is important that we understand the results of scientific findings so that we can be intelligent in making decisions about our own children. The Public Health Service of the United States, whose duty it is to protect the health of the nation, is a core of physicians, scientists, and other professional health workers. It has served us with integrity since 1798. I have asked the Surgeon General of the Public Health Service to talk with us tonight about vaccines and the Salk vaccine in particular. He has served as an officer in the service since 1930 and as your Surgeon General since 1948. It is my privilege to present a distinguished public servant, Dr. Leonard A. Sheely. Many questions have been raised <clears throat> in recent weeks about the new vaccine against poliomyelitis. People are asking, is it absolutely safe? Does it really protect against polio? Will there be enough vaccine for large-scale use this summer? I will give you the facts about the vaccine as I know them, and I want to give you some idea of the outlook for the future. First, something about the disease itself. Polio occurs everywhere, in this country and throughout the world. It is caused by a virus so small that its presence cannot be known except by its effect on living animals <clears throat> or on cells in tissue culture. Nearly everyone is in repeated contact with the virus and is infected by it at some time in his life. The disease is generally very mild and goes unnoticed. In cases that come to the attention of physicians, there is fever, sometimes a sore throat, sometimes the muscles ache, but recovery is usually prompt. However, in about 1% or less of these cases, the virus invades the spinal cord or the brain and causes muscle weakness or paralysis. Polio brings many personal tragedies each year. It is truly a national health problem. But we should recognize that more children die each year from pneumonia, cancer and heart disease, for instance, than from polio. Even without immunization during an average year, the chance that any individual of any age will get paralytic poliomyelitis is one in 7,500. One in 32,000 will suffer permanent crippling, and the chances are only one in 68,000 will die from polio. So far this year, throughout the nation in the age group from 1 to 19, <clears throat> there have been 1 and 3 tenths cases of paralytic polio among each 100,000. Last year, for the same period, the rate was 1 and 4 tenths. The comparable 5-year average was 1 and 1 tenth per thousand. While it is much too early to make any predictions, there is no reason to believe that the incidence of polio this year will be greater than the 5-year average. Experience indicates, however, that there will be scattered local epidemics, and some may be severe. Let me tell you in a few words about the development of the polio vaccine. Dr. Jonas Salk had the knowledge, intuition, and tenacity to create a poliomyelitis vaccine out of the sum of available scientific knowledge in virology and immunology. <clears throat> the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, through public contributions, 
supported the development and application of Dr. Salk's vaccine. It was carried through the experimental stage, tested on a large scale last year, and launched this year as a major nationwide immunization program under foundation leadership. Now I want to explain how a vaccine works and how it is made. To acquire immunity against contagious disease, our bodies must create defenses against the bacteria or viruses which cause these diseases. These defenses are called antibodies. Antibodies of various kinds are always present in the system. Whenever the organisms of disease invade the body, the system becomes a battleground between the forces of health and disease. Vaccines are the product of infectious agents. A vaccine stimulates the body <coughs> to produce its own antibodies. These antibodies then can help prevent disease. That is how a vaccine against poliomyelitis works. Now let me tell you how it is made. First, polio virus is grown on tissue from monkey kidneys. Since there are three important types of polio virus, each must be grown separately. Second, the virus of each type is inactivated separately by treatment with formaldehyde over a period of days. Third, the three inactivated viruses are mixed. Finally, <clears throat> the mixture is bottled for distribution. Now let me explain what we mean by an activation. At the beginning, there might be as many as four million live virus particles in a teaspoon of the substance. At the lowest point, that virus concentration can be measured. There might be only one virus particle in a quart of material. But in practice, the manufacturers don't stop there. The inactivation process is continued beyond this point. You may wonder why the manufacturers cannot treat this vaccine fluid indefinitely with formaldehyde for added safety. This is not possible because the vaccine loses some of its power to give immunity if it is treated too long. A good vaccine must be made both as effective and as safe as possible. The basic theory has been that during the period of treatment with formaldehyde, the course of an activation followed a straight line down. With continuing treatment, it was calculated that there would be perhaps as little as one live virus in a million tons of vaccine fluid. Actual experience in large-scale manufacture has demonstrated that, whether for theoretical or practical reasons, the course of an activation does not necessarily follow a straight line. Instead, it often tends to form a curve. This means that we cannot be sure that there has been adequate inactivation by getting a single negative test at a single point. We have learned that it is necessary to have two consecutive negative tests three days apart. From experience accumulated since April 12th, we have learned that it was possible, imposs that it was possible to build into large-scale manufacturing and testing process added safeguards. Our policy has been safety, not speed, except as the latter is compatible with safety. There are three key points for safety testing during this process. The first is during the period of inactivation. Two consecutive tests in tissue culture must show no active virus before the three types are mixed. The second test is done after the mixture. This test must show no live virus, not only in tissue culture, but also in monkeys. The third is a test made on samples a vaccine after it has been bottled and before distribution. I want to make it clear that there is always the possibility of very minute amounts of active virus in the vaccine. However, these amounts of active virus have been reduced as low as science can reduce them without destroying the effectiveness of the vaccine. The possible presence of very, very small amounts of active virus is true of all vaccines made as this polio vaccine is made from active virus. We have successfully used these vaccines made from live organisms for as long as 50 years because medical science knows that they convey a great benefit to mankind. 
It took time to work out the extremely technical details of these additional safeguards with scientists and manufacturers. The new standards require some changes in production and testing processes by the manufacturers. Making and testing a vaccine is a difficult and delicate process. You cannot make viruses meet deadlines. You cannot force scientific work to meet dates on a calendar. And it must be kept in mind that the entire process of manufacturing a batch of vaccine from beginning to end takes about 90 days. That is a reason why we can give you no precise estimates of how much vaccine will be available at any given time. The manufacturers have assured me that they can and will produce vaccine under these requirements. But I want to make it clear that they will not be able to produce enough vaccine to immunize all children this summer. The field trial of 1954 showed that though a child is vaccinated, there will still remain a chance that he will acquire paralytic poliomyelitis because the vaccine does not cause all children to develop immunity. <clears throat> this is true with respect to all immunization procedures. It is true because there is no such thing as a perfect vaccine against this disease, poliomyelitis, or any other disease. But, and this is the important point, the risk is much less than if the child were not vaccinated. I've been presenting the national picture as I see it as Surgeon General of the Public Health Service. By releasing more vaccine for use, as I did yesterday, I have again demonstrated our confidence in its safety and effectiveness. But conditions vary widely in different sections of the country and at different times of the year. These general considerations must be applied by doctors in each community. Each physician has his own training and experience. And most important, he knows <clears throat> the individual needs of his patients at a particular time and in a particular community. The family doctor always has, in addition, access to the technical information from health officers and from medical organizations. It is the family physician, then, who can best help parents who have special questions and problems. Decisions on polio vaccination, like many others concerning health that arise from time to time, are decisions that parents have to make with the advice of their physicians. Ladies and gentlemen, from Dr. Sheely's report to you, I know that you feel that the scientists, the public health service, the doctors and the manufacturers are working together to give our children a safe and effective vaccine. To that end, we shall all continue to work. This has been a special report on the Salk polio vaccine. The Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare, Mrs. Ovita Kalpabi, and the Surgeon General of the United States Public Health Service, Dr. Leonard A. Sheely, have presented the highlights of the final report of the department on the test it conducted on the SOC vaccine. The United States Public Health Service is part of the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, specifically charged by the government to protect and improve the health of the people of the nation. The Public Health Service, under the Surgeon General, had its origins in early American history. It was in 1798 that Congress passed the first bill, which eventually led to the establishment of the Public Health Service as we know it today, as part of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. The department is the newest in the federal government, having been established by Congress on April 1, 1953. This program has come to you from Washington and was a presentation of the combined radio and a television industry. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.